Tom Walsh. Welcome to Between Two Beers. Thanks for having me, guys. It's um, I actually have got a bit of water sitting next to me, and I feel like I shouldn't. I think I should go and grab a beer, really, shouldn't I? Oh, you no, no, you're all right. You're in good company. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the latest press clippings I could find suggested that when you got back to New Zealand, you were going to take a couple of months away <laughs> from the top foot. Is that right? What have you been doing with yourself? Um, yeah, that's, that's bang on. Uh, apart from the two weeks in quarantine, which was fantastic, uh, I've pretty much just uh, been either, you know, working on, we've got a section um, about uh, 20 minutes north of Christchurch, 10 acre of section, so I'm um, just building a, bit, a shed on it. Um, and uh, so just working through that, doing some uh, the internal fit out of it at the moment, which is pretty cool. It's, you know, strapping the old tool belt back on and, and, you know, reminding myself of, you know, the good old days when I used to do this all the time and, and build and stuff. But uh, apart from that, just, just playing a bunch of golf um, is that something I really love doing and uh, and just chilling out. And, and Dana and I um, went away on holiday as well. So um, all, all in the last kind of five to six weeks. Nice. That, that mm. sounds, sounds really nice. Uh, the way we start things at Between Two Beers, we tell the audience how we know the guests. So, Shay, how do you know Tom Walsh? First time to meet. Um, I will say this, though. In researching the episode, I jumped on Wallshot. And there are a few T-shirts which I'm quite interested in uh, in purchasing. One of them, um, the quote, and I've got to look at this because I wrote it down. If the bar isn't bending, you're pretending. And yeah. the other one is uh, is running is overrated, which I can I can really subscribe to that. So, will um, Stevie had his chance last week with DJ Forbes to talk about running and Broncos and yo-yo tests <laughs> and stuff. So. I'm looking forward to um, hearing some stories about what you can throw around uh, in the gym, but we'll get to that in, in due course. Um, Stevie, you've probably got a closer connection with your uh, your media hat on to Tom. Yeah, well, Tom's obviously been sort of an A-list athlete in New Zealand over the last decade. Um, so as a sports journalist, I've covered him a lot. I was live blogging the shit out of him in, in Tokyo. Um, but yeah, first time speaking to him. Um, but across this podcast journey, we've had a lot of Olympians on at this point, and a name that keeps coming up is you got to get Tom Walsh on. You got to get Tom Walsh on. So yeah, really excited. I've, I've listened to a few uh, bits and pieces you've done across media, and I can see you're an open, genuine, honest guy. So I think we're going to have a bit of fun. Um, I actually thought we had a really rock solid episode planned out. We like to do our research. We like to get things in order, and then at the eleventh hour a little Tweety Bird has come in with a couple of gems, which we're actually going to start with. Um, so I've got it on, on pretty good authority that, now I'm not sure if it was this last time you come back from Tokyo or another trip back from Tokyo, but <laughs> just so happened to coincide with you moving house. And as you arrived back in New, in New Zealand, uh, in Christchurch, I think it was, uh, the drug testers arrived at your house and mm. you managed a very strategical planning to get them to, to help. Is, can you fill us in on that, Jan? Yeah, so we'll take the story back a little bit. Um, so I think it was, it might have been the last time I was in Tokyo, uh, maybe 2018, uh, around December. And um, so uh, I was there actually on a Japanese game show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was there, I was in the country for 24 hours. I flew up uh, the night before and, and did the game show the whole day, and then then came home that night. Um, and uh, it was it was called the Top Athlete Grand Prix. And so um, there was there was three different events, um, but I only had to do one event, which was which was kind of like tug of war, but it was pushing a glass glass wall instead. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so I kind of got there. Didn't really know who else was there. They had some other big names from, you know, Japanese sport and, uh, and some UFC fighters and stuff like that. But I, you know, don't really follow UFC a hell of a lot. Um, but they had Nipo Lalala there as one of my competitors. And as soon as I knew that, I was just like, well, this is what he does for a job on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> I'm stuffed, you know. So, um, so anyway, so there was that and there was like a – a pommel horse thing that they had to run along and jump over with a trampoline, and and then there was a uh, a ball. Uh, a, they had to hit a hit kind of a um, a button, and that would drop the ball. And every time you caught the ball, the button moved back further and so forth. So anyway, so that was what I was up there for. 
Um, and uh, I got back home. I think I might have got home at like maybe uh, maybe like midday or something like that. Uh, and we were just moving into our new house where we are now. And um, I think we were like maybe two loads in out of probably five or six and uh, got the trail almost full. I think we had like a, a couch to move in and uh, a couch to move get into the trailer. And I see these drug testers coming up the drive. Um, and I always get the same two drug testers, Jeff and uh, Justin. So Jeff is a, is a pilot for New Zealand and Justin's a builder. And uh, so I saw them coming up the driveway and I was like, well, actually, you know what? For once, these guys can work for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I managed to I managed to hold on for about, uh, I think it was two or three trips back and forth, um, getting their help. And of course, one of them, Justin, had to be in the car with me, and then Jeff had to drive my other mate who was helping me in his car. So we got we actually got a few loads out of them. That was that was bloody good. Gold. That's gold. Um, yeah. Okay. Second little tip. Uh, I've been informed that perhaps your fan base skews quite old, and there's uh, you sort of hit a chord with some of the older demographic, maybe the eighty plus, um, um, perhaps in Ashburton. There, there might have been an incident where uh, you know <laughs> an encounter with a fan took a turn you weren't expecting. Well, yeah, look, um, beggars can't be choosers, and uh, <laughs> you got you to cater to, to your clientele, and, and not only the older women um, tend to like my company, but but also I do have quite a big gay following, um, so. Uh, you know, look, it is what it is, um, and um, some people just find me attractive. Uh, but uh, the uh, the 80-year-old woman, you've done your research quite well. I'm not sure who you got this off, but uh, <laughs> the 80-year-old uh, woman, I was in Ashburton, uh, and people who know Ashburton, there's a Z petrol station on the main drag there. And I'd just gone and filled up, and I went inside to pay, and I was coming back out. And um, the person, the lady was parked next to me, and uh, she was making a, she wasn't going for the door, she was coming like directly across and making a beeline for me. I'm like, geez, what have I done? You know, you know, anything like that. And so she comes up and says, Oh, shakes, man, it's, you know, great to meet you, and you know, you're doing New Zealand proud, and all these kind of things. I'm like, oh, sweet, thanks, nice to meet you. And we kind of went on our way, and, and I um, said, have a lovely day, might see you around sometime. And as I turned to walk away, I just feel this, and um, I got a tap on the ass <laughs> by an 80-year-old woman. Um, and then as I was dazed and confused um, by this whole thing occurring, uh, I turned back around and looked back at the car, and her – Husband, I'm assuming, was sitting in the front seat and he was giving me the thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So, uh, yeah, no, there's been some um, definitely interesting uh, occurrences with uh, some of my fan base. Now, Tom, are, are you, Tom, are you sure that she knew who you were? Because I understand as well there might have been a couple oh. of cases of mistaken identity at a, uh, at a brunch or a coffee with a reasonably... Um, other famous New Zealander. Yeah, look, that's this has happened a few times, not just um, uh, with that other New Zealander, but uh, it was actually the first. I didn't realise this was occurring, and it was actually occurring the other way around to start with, which you know I'm a little proud of. But um, and actually, he lived used to live about 100 metres away from me. Um, Joe Moody uh, is who you're referring to here. So Joe, I first met Joe a few years ago, and and he kind of came up to me and said, you know, Tom, mate, um, just wondering, do you ever do you ever get confused as me? And I'm like, no, of course not, mate. What? No, that's silly. So, oh, shit, I get confused as you sometimes. I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, that's pretty cool, you know. Like, he's a famous all black. People think he's me. You know, that's awesome. Anyway, so uh, about a year later, I was, um, I was sitting at, at – uh, I was having a, a chat to Richie McCall. And um, and we're at uh, the Roadwood Fresh on uh, John's Road by the airport. And uh, we're sitting down there, and, and, and a lot of people are, like, looking, right, because it's Richie. And um, then right at the end of our kind of chat, this 
random guy comes over and just, you know, shakes, shakes Richie's hand and goes, mate, not really great to meet you. Um, you know, I hope you hope everything's going well um, and uh, hope you have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, Richie. And then he goes, and nice to meet you too, Joe. <laughs> 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 and Richie just loses, loses his mind about it because he's going, are you kidding me? Like, you got confused as Joe Bloody Moody. <laughs> Amazing. And I, oh, I just let it slide. That's gold. Um, shout out to our little Tweety Bird. That, that went better than, than I could have expected. Great, sto- great stories. Uh, great start. Okay. So we're going to move on. The first thing we're going to talk about is Jacko Gill. So mm. on December 12th, 2009, you threw 20.21 meters with the 5 kg shot put in the under 18 category to win the senior boys title at the New Zealand Secondary Schools Track and Field Champs, setting a New Zealand youth record by over two meters. The next day, 14 year old Jack O'Gill beat it. Then over the next four years, moved that record four meters. So he was a junior sensation. He won it gold at the World Juniors as a 15-year-old, throwing against 18 and 19-year-olds. And then the viral video started. So Shay and I were talking about this um, before the, the show. We were like, where were you when you saw those Jacko Gill videos? And I went and checked one from 2010. It's had 450,000 views. That's the one with the, the Rocky soundtrack and the boxing and the hill sprints and the basement training. So an absolute phenom. Do you remember seeing those videos and watching him blow up? I'm sure you do. But where was your head at with all that stuff as you <laughs> were at that time? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I remember like it was yesterday. Um, look, uh, I thought I was pretty good, to be honest. You know, I just broke the New Zealand record um, and the first man ever to throw 20, 20 metres with any weight in New Zealand. And then Jacko just, you know, over the previous <laughs> next two or three years just blows it out of the water. But so, um, yeah, look, I was, uh, especially around that time, I was extremely jealous of Jacko's success. Um, I was, uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't like the guy only because he was beating me, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so there was no reason really for me, but it was just jealousy. Uh, and, you know, that, there's a few moments of my career which has made me go towards shot put because at that point in time I was a, a pretty keen cricket player. I thought I was probably going to go that way. I was also a pretty keen rugby player and really athletics was my third sport. Um, and uh, and so Jack obviously did that at um, secondary school nationals. Then the following year he won World Juniors, which is under 20s at like 15 or 16, which is incredible. Uh, and I bombed out completely. And, of course, you know, everyone's going, Jacko, you're amazing. Uh, how good is this? And I'm going, stuff this guy. Like, well, I deserve some of that, you know. When I, when I didn't really, but that was just me being a young, you know, 18, 19-year-old at the time. And so that kind of made me uh, jump in into throwing a lot more um, and then put more, it, more of my eggs in that basket. Uh, and then there was another moment a few years later that which doesn't concern Jacko, which really made me put all my eggs uh, in the throwing basket when I was about 21. But, uh, you know, I, I, I still can't do some of the stuff that Jacko was doing then. Um, and I'm a, I'm a full, you know, I'm a professional full-time athlete for the last, you know, probably eight or nine years. And, uh, you know, that just shows you how good he was um, at such a young age too. This is a little bit left field, but am I right in thinking both your dads were national shot put champions as well? Yeah, yeah. I think um, yeah, I'm pretty sure Walter was, which is his father, and my you know I definitely know my father was because he's reminded me about it a number of times. <laughs> and I don't know how this works, guys, but maybe you can shed some light on it. Somehow he still thinks he's thrown further than I have, even though his PB was 16 meters. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how how that works. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Steven, Steven's the dad of the two of us, so he's probably got a few records on his younger son as well. <laughs> yeah, but did, you, did, did your dads that they didn't cross over at all and compete like you two have done as as kids? No, I think my father's a little bit older um, than than Jacko's father, uh, and my father was more of a rugby player and just did it at high school. So uh, he played rugby. Um, and actually was in the 1974 South Canterbury team to win the Ramfley Shield. So um, he went that way instead. Of, and Walter definitely went towards athletics a lot more. On, just on that viral video side of it, 
Was there any positives, like Shay and I were talking about how it was our glimpse into shot put, it sort of brought us into that world a little bit. Were there positive spin-offs of that much attention coming into shot put, or was that just all focused on Jacko? No, I think there definitely was. Um, I, uh, I think, I think uh, that's one thing the social media has done, not always positively, but, but generally with that, uh, video it was was pretty positive stuff um, uh, to come out and, and kind of show people like especially like what shot putters can do and what shot putters do do uh, and just shine a light on that kind of thing so um, he was uh, pretty incredible and it did stir up a lot of things because like little things like the following year um, after that he uh, chose, chose not to go I think it was 2012 yeah it must have been yeah. two years after that he chose not to go to the, to, to the Olympics um, and had a qualifying mark. And the whole story was, you know, I was the one that stopped him going because, in theory, I had a shot at making the Olympic team um, and, therefore, he didn't get automatically selected. And so there was positive things, and, and that was my first ever interview. I was a, a nobody and getting interviewed by TV1 because, you know, Jacko, Jacko Gill was not going to the Olympics because of me. <laughs> And because I possibly still had a chance to qualify, so yeah, it was. I think it was definitely positive, and I think, as I said, people um, love to see that kind of crazy stuff too. My um, my recollection might be off here, and I don't proclaim to be an athletics aficionado by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't recall there being too many prominent field athletes in that in that kind of time period. And and like Stephen said, I feel like that whole kind of burst onto the scene and then you carried that torch on afterwards it it opened the door to new zealand sporting public around oh shit actually there's more than beatrice farmawina and who is now dame valerie adams we've mm-hmm. also got a couple of pretty um pretty sharp shot putters on the male side as well that um that can fly the flag on the world stage yeah i think uh around the you know beatrice and val uh they're just complete outliers in terms of physically you know, you look at them and they are, you know, Val 6'7", Beatrice is not much shorter. Um, so they've got size on their side, which, you know, we, like, I'm not 6'7". Six, six, <laughs> um, you know, so so I think with Jacko and I, we're both, you know, I'm 6'1", Jacko 6'3". We're not overly big guys. Yes, yeah, for sure, we're bigger than a normal human. But I think maybe it's because people think it might be a little bit more attainable to become a a shot putter because of we're not just these genetically freaked outliers that are you have to be oh, oh you see Val oh, you have to be six seven you have to be a hundred and twenty five kgs and and built like no tomorrow to be a female shot putter well I think that's one thing that Jacko and I have kind of taught the New Zealand public maybe you don't need to be. I'm interested in the dynamic between two guys at the very top of their field because I come from sort of a team sport background where you wouldn't really sort of socialise or fraternise with rival teams perhaps. But is that different with individual sports? Like are you and Jacko sort of, you know, texting each other or calling each other out of competition? Like do you have that sort of relationship or is that would that be very unusual for two sort of rivals at the very top of their field? I think it just depends. Like Jacko and I, I we get on really well. Um, Jacko comes down to Christchurch and trains a little bit um, and we never – we're together like it was our, tri- our pre-camp before at Tokyo. We trained together a bunch and things like that. So it was really good. Um, and it's really nice because throwing a shot is quite a lonely sport sometimes. So whether it's Jacko or other guys on the road, um, quite often I personally try and get them, them there and try and throw together or live together. Um, but also saying that we're not, you know, I'm not really tight with Jacko either, but we get on really well. So um, I think it just depends what type of kind of person you are. Uh, you know, you look at the 100-metre sprinters and, you know, they sit at other ends of the dining hall um, and won't talk to each other. They'll make sure they miss each other at meets. So, like, you go to Paris and I'll go to London and, and just, you know, they play the whole game. Um, where Throwers kind of aren't like that. They, um, you know, we generally get on pretty well. I've got, I've got a lot of questions about the big boys of the world, but I'm sort of going to build into that because I want to skip forward 10 years, essentially, to Tokyo, uh, where you and Jacko are in the final um, of a fucking tense competition. Like I said, I was live blogging the qualification and the final, yeah. like the whole thing, and that was one of my most memorable 
parts of the games for a number of reasons that we're going to get into. Um, one of them was like you looked set for the shock exit and qualification. It brought our newsroom to a standstill. There was confusion everywhere. Um, I think it was about two minutes of stalling with you on screen, kind of looking confused and us knowing not what the fuck was going on. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it was relief and you were through to the final. Can you can you explain to us in real time how you were processing that that whole drama? Yeah, so probably easier if I start with round one. Um, you know, generally when you go into qualifying, for people who don't know, for, for shot put in the field events, usually they set a distance. And then if you throw over that distance, you get automatically through to the final. Uh, and then if, if there's not 12 guys who hit that distance, they take the top 12 guys with distance. Um, so usually you try and get in there and get out. So you, you throw your first one over the mark and you go, thanks, guys, for coming. I'll, come, I'll see you tomorrow morning or whatever it is. And so I went in there to try and do that. I think I had to throw 21.30, which is yeah, neither here nor there for me. I should be able to do that in my sleep. Uh, managed to do it on my first throw uh, and kind of got called for a foul. And I was like, oh, that's, that's a bit funny. You know, I kind of... I kind of know usually when I'm fouling or I'm close to fouling and I don't really feel like I am. And I kind of challenged the guy on it and he kind of went, oh, well, you can reveal it later if you want, but, you know, this decision stands. And I'm like, oh, all right. Then second round comes and um, and uh, he fouls me again. I'm like, that definitely wasn't a foul. Um, and, he go, and he points at this wee um, shotgun light, a small shotgun light, and uh, it was knocked over. And um, I'm going, well, unless I stood on it completely, which I didn't, um, it's blown over in the wind or whatever. And he goes, no, no, you hit it with your foot. I'm like, well, it's not part of the circle, so I think it should be overturned. And it was overturned because it actually turned out that I, my foot came forward over it but didn't touch anything else, so therefore it was a fine throw. But it wasn't far enough um, to automatically qualify. And then coming into the last round, which is do or die, like you know, it's if I don't throw well this throw, then my Olympic Games is over. Pack your bags, go home, Tommy. You know, you're done. Um, and I kind of, what I was saying to myself is, look, this is what you do for a job. You're bloody good at it. You, you train this, actually, this type of scenario all the time in training. We have one throw comps all the time where, like, if you, if you don't do it, um, you've got to, you know, go for a swim in a pond or, you know, or, you know, whatever, you know, there's tons of different bets we have online. Um, and if you do do it, then, you know, it's pride and, you know, so it's, uh, it's something we train all the time. And I was kind of saying those, those few things to myself, like, this is what you do for a job. You're bloody good at it. And you do this all the time. And I generally nail it in training. I generally get it done. So that's fine. Let's go and get it done in the circle. So, boom, go in there, knock one out there. I'm like, sweet, got that, piece of piss. Not even close to fouling. Walk back out of the circle, give it a bit of the old the fist pump. Um, and then then the guy sitting next to Trevor is holding up a red flag. I'm like, Hold the phone. What the fuck is going on here? And so I stood in this. So what the biggest thing you, you, to do is slow the whole process down is you don't leave the circle. So that's why I was standing around the circle because as soon as you clear the area, then the next person could go. So I just stood around the circle, if not in the circle, and I was going, Trevor, mate, what the fuck? And he's giving me the old, I, I can't see anything, you know? Um, and uh, and he's on it. He's got the earpiece in his head and he's kind of talking away on it going, can you review that? And I'm kind of going, Trevor, what the fuck is going on here? You know, that wasn't a foul. And he's kind of talking on it. He's like, yep, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, 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 okay, um, yep, yep. And then he gives me, down by his thigh, he gives me a wee thumbs up. And I'm like, oh, that's good, you know, that's good. And so I walk away about five metres, start taking off my finger tape. I'm like, oh, hold on, I better actually get this correct. So I go back over to him and go, you know, Trevor, is this actually, and he said, yep, you're fine, you're perfect, you're through. It was 21.30 or 40 or whatever it was. Um, so, you know, it was a massive relief, but it was also what I trained for all the time, day in, day out. Um, and I've always, well, not always, but most of the time over the last 
seven or eight, oh, not seven or eight, five or six years especially, when it's the method of being able to pull it out. And so just reminding yourself of that um, because you can quite easily go down in the negative kind of spin, like why is this happening to me? What have I done to deserve this? Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, it was very helpful having Trevor. Um, uh, Trevor Spill is, is a guy's name. He actually lives uh, – everyone lives in this neighbourhood, by the way. He lives about <laughs> yeah. uh, 150 metres down the road from here too. So it might have been the cash I left in his mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, so he's, he's always on the shot put. So it's uh, actually quite good to have a Kiwi there that can keep things under control and you can talk to pretty easily. Have you spoken to family about what they went through over that period? Because obviously you know, you're confident that it's going to get sorted out. Like you know the inside track. But they're watching. They would have been like me thinking, what the fuck? Is this yeah. four years down the drain? Like were they having little mini heart attacks? Have you spoke to them about it since? Five years, five years down the drain. Um, uh, no, look, it's uh, yeah, they, they were like because because what happened was, uh, well, I, of course, I knew what was going on in the stadium as you said, but obviously TV was switching in and out. They didn't know commentators didn't know live feed obviously stalled as well in terms of results. So there was a lot of limbo for people at home and and. Um, you know, I think my mother, my mother's probably the worst person to ever watch any sporting event with flat out, even if you, even if I'm not involved, even if someone else is involved. So she was pulling her hair out, um, you know, and, and things like that. So I'm not exactly, I think it was probably just disbelief from people kind of going, because, you know, I was pretty open about what I wanted to do. I wanted to go there and win. Um, and uh, And then to not even make the final is kind of like, hold on, that's, should have just been a, yeah, like that should have just been a, a lock. But, uh, yeah, it was definitely took some years off. Uh, I think I felt more under control than what everyone else thought the situation was, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. that's that's what I wanted to ask you, was that your, your retelling of the story demonstrates the control that you had at the time. And mm. I'm wondering two things. One is, does your visualisation training prepare you for something like that? And two, were you really as calm and diplomatic as you've explained the story here? Or is your blood boiling and you're fighting all of your emotions to just kind of keep a calm head? No, look, I, to be completely honest, I was reasonably calm, obviously very surprised about what was going on, um, but pretty calm about the whole situation generally. Um, and because I knew that I, cause I, knew that I, was, I was still in control, if that makes sense. Um, where I still had control um, over what I could do. So, yeah, um, I, yeah, I could only imagine what it was like for my girlfriend or my parents, or my you know, uh, other other close friends and family and stuff like that. But uh, I, yeah, I felt reasonably calm in the whole situation. So we've got to get we've got to get Trevor a um, sorry we just got to get, make sure we get Trevor a, a services to New Zealand Athletics acknowledgement at the next Queen's uh, Queen's Honours, I think. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> so fast forward to the final and, and you get the bronze. And, and this was another, like I said, there was a couple of moments that really stood out the games. And um, I'm just going to play a little uh, clip from this interview. Once again, you drive the New Zealand flag around it. You've just done the lap of honour. Yeah. How does this one compare to Rio five years ago? Uh, it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the last 18 months we've run hasn't been easy. And uh, to be standing here now with, with a flag on my back, it's pretty cool. So we had um, Sarah Hirani on a, a previous episode, and she had a really similar emotional outpouring after her medal interview. Um, and it struck such a powerful chord. But it made me want to ask because obviously there's so much that goes into the build-up that people don't know. Um, you spoke about the 18 months leading into that and obviously by the emotion, like I said, there's a lot going on, but it's some really difficult times, I imagine. Are you able to help sort of paint a picture of um, what you were getting at in that interview? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, everyone's gone through a lot of shit in the last 18 months. 
um, and it and carries on um, at the moment. And personally for myself, what I struggled dramatically with was, to be honest, I, I got through our first lockdown, which was in, so it feels so long ago now, uh, April, I think it was, April kind of started mm-hmm. May maybe, um, reasonably well. Um, I trained all the way through it, uh, throwing went well, all these kind of things. Um, and then once I came out, I kind of realised that we were pretty good in New Zealand, you know, uh, but the rest of the world was, you know, uh, didn't know what was heads or tails um, or up or down. And that was the kind of moment of time, probably around that May, uh, June time, where I started to really struggle. Um, because one thing that I, I love is that competition side uh, and, 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 and true competition too. Um, and when I know that, that it matters as well. Um, so, like, look, for sure, the start of this year, losing Jack a few times, not great, but I knew that that wasn't really the true competition. So, anyway, so going back to coming out of our lockdown and then realising that I was probably staying in New Zealand that winter for the first time in a long time and not actually getting overseas and, and doing the competitions and doing what excites me and doing what gives me energy and and, and gets my blood pumping and, and um, just that stuff that really, you know, that's a huge reason why I do the sport. It really hit me hard and um, I really struggled. Um, I started chasing things. I started worrying about what other people were doing. Um, that were able to travel in, you know, August, September. Um, uh, some Americans were able to travel and so forth and Europeans. I started worrying about them. I started, you know, worrying if I if I still had it, if I could still do it. Uh, and that kind of lingered around all the way through um, from, you know, really July all the way through until um, probably June this year, to be completely honest with you. Um, a lot of doubt. A lot of kind of, are you too old? Can you get back up to speed? Can you ever throw 22 metres again? Do you have what it takes? Um, a lot of just doubt um, and and a lot of beating myself up along with it, uh, which is never a good idea, um, a word to the wise. Uh, look, I'm pretty tough on myself at the best of times, but when you're kind of down in the dumps and wondering if you can still do it and then jumping on yourself, when you don't do it in Christchurch in, you know, March when it's cold and there's nothing really on the line, I kind of forgot about um, – I, for, I, for, I forgot about a lot of the things that surround the competitions that generally can make them better and make them worse. I was just taking them purely in isolation and going, well, I failed there. I didn't succeed. Rather than going, well, you know what, today – it was 14 degrees outside. I was wearing three layers of clothes to try and stay warm. Um, the next best shot put up through 18 metres in the comp, uh, and I threw 21.50. That's actually not too bad. Um, I wasn't doing that. I was kind of going, why don't you throw 22.50, you know? Uh, and that led all the way through until um, probably my – I had five comps uh, overseas, so I had two in Arizona – I one in Doha, one in Italy, and one in Nashville. And um, so those five comps uh, took me through until about uh, when was it? mid-June. And that was kind of the point in time where I was over there competing on the world stage with my mates again, but my expectation level was way too high. And I was beating, my, again, carried on. I was beating myself up. You know, you warmed up well. You've been training well. Why didn't you throw well in competition? You know, all these things. And um, maybe you don't have it. And then you hear a whisper. Someone goes, oh, maybe I think Tom's a bit off the pace. Or he won't be good enough and all these kind of things. So I, it just carried on, the, the, the consistency of beating myself up um, and not really taking things into context. Um, and then I sat down. Well, there's obviously a lot of time, you know, talking to my girlfriend, talking to Quinny, my sports psychologist, talking to Dale, my coach, over that time. and. Uh, and obviously some of the stuff linked in also with, with COVID because um, once I got to America, uh, sorry, I'm jumping a little bit over, over the place. Once I got to America in May to start those five series of five comps, uh, I was so stressed about 
what not to do, what to do, where mm. to wear my mask, where to wash my hands, where to eat. Should I eat at this place? Can I eat in? Can I just take away? Should I call to order so they bring it out to me? I was so worried about all that shit that mm. I was having um, dizzy spells, uh, vertigo symptoms, um, all sorts of things like that. Um, and, of course, that mix with beating myself up <laughs> was not a great thing. Um, so then, you know, uh, I felt like those last three comps before um, Tokyo, I kind of said to myself and that I just want to go out there and, and enjoy throwing again. I was really enjoying the trainings because I had no expectations on the trainings. Um and therefore, they they then went well. But prior to that, I had so much expectation on the uh, competitions and what they should have gone like. Uh, and when they didn't go, again, beat myself up. But so the big thing in those last three comps before Tokyo was I want to go out there and just enjoy throwing, enjoy putting on a show for the crowd, enjoy uh, talking shit to the boys halfway through rounds. Enjoy, you know, getting getting the crowd behind us, getting the clap going. Uh, just enjoy the music in the stadium. Enjoy the whole atmosphere. Um, and I remember sitting outside um, in Poland where we were at the first comp, sitting outside the hotel having a beer with Dale and going, Dale, I threw 21.46 that day, which was shit. <laughs> that was actually shit. I should have thrown further. And I, and, and, uh, but I said, Dale, actually – I actually enjoyed myself out there today. Um, and I said, I'm really struggling because I know I should have thrown further. There was no reason why I shouldn't have thrown further. The competition was good. Uh, the weather was good. My training's been going good, all these things. And I, so I, I know I should be angry at that, but I'm actually not because I actually enjoyed it for the first time in such a long time. And... That was kind of the moment that clicked and changed everything um, for me. And, um, you know, of course, they've been telling me to do this for the past six months, you know, but, you know, I don't listen that well sometimes. So, uh, you know, and sometimes it's just got to be there right in front of you. And, um, and that was kind of the turning point where I gave, I started giving myself a chance to, to throw well rather than, you know, beating myself up about not throwing well all the time. As a sports journo, I love, we all love when athletes show their real emotion. And like, like I said, that's why it, it touched me so much. It, it was so memorable. Um, and I made, you sort of made the joke about, you know, it was five years, not four, not a joke, but it was five years of, of build up. Are you an emotional guy? Like, were you surprised that came out or did you have outlets where all the stuff you've just talked about, you were actually able to, to talk about it in public or was that quite different for you? No, I, I, I probably thought that it might come out um, for sure, no matter what the result was. Um, you know, and, and I actually had my team review about two or three weeks ago and, and, and again, talking through the season, I became a blubbering mess. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and there was plenty of phone calls, you know, again, to, to my partner, Dana, uh, to Quinny, to... Um, that, you know, I was probably crying more than speaking over that period of time um, kind of thing. So, and people don't see, people, uh, yeah, people don't, so they don't always like to see that too though, you know, um, which is tricky uh, and it's tough. It is really tough being vulnerable uh, in those circumstances. And, but when you are comfortable enough with someone and you can become vulnerable with them, that's generally the start of turning the corner and, and moving forward. And especially that's what I found. Um, and yeah, and then you're quite right. Yeah, it was, it was five years. It wasn't four. And, and, um, and there was a lot, <laughs> there was a, in, that, in that whole extra year, there wasn't a lot of positive stuff until probably the last, you know, six weeks. Um, so yeah, it, it took its toll mentally. Um, Dana, my girlfriend has been a patient, patient woman with me because um, I think I've been grumpy for the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, so, yeah, it's um, – I think I'm not – well, I know I'm not the only person that has found that. You know, I, there's been a bunch of people that train in HP in Christchurch that are, have been going through exactly the same thing. It's um, 
that, that Olympics particularly, I guess it, it's, it's natural, right? Because as we pointed out, the five years, not the four years, but there was for Kiwis, it was packed with those emotional moments. You know, we've had Emma Twig on, Stephen and I have spoken about it with Sarah Hidden as well. You know, when Twiggy won gold, it was it was an emotional time. When when you take your medal, it's an emotional time as well. I know Steve wants to talk about Ryan Krauser, but I think Krauser mm. also suffered a, a an emotional um, situation to have to deal with in the lead up to that as well. Where I think it's his his grandfather passed away. I think in the lead up to the Olympics. Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure when his grandfather passed away, but it was definitely prior to the Olympics at some point in time. Um, so look, I think uh, so many people were were dealing with with shit. Um, it's actually quite. I go back to Twiggy. It's quite funny. I um, Twiggy and I were were at. Uh, we went to a Toyota weekend together, and we were guest speaking. And um, one of the questions was um, from uh, the person who was doing the Q and A was, you know, who was your role model when you grew up? And uh, Twiggy answered my question for me before I got the chance. She said, uh, Tom, mate, I think I was your role model growing up because you've got a poster of me on your wall. <laughs> I was, Gosh, yeah, yeah, Twiggy, sorry, you're right. I feel quite embarrassed. You know, I actually want you to sign it. Um, so anyway, so when, when Twiggy won gold, I texted her and I said, uh, I, best, I better get that poster out and put it back up, I think, Twiggy. You know? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, cool to see her uh, go so well after uh, two fourths um, and obviously yeah. – and, and coming back from uh, not rowing for a few years as well. So, uh, yeah, so many challenges um, for her to, to overcome mentally. And, uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, going back to Ryan, I'm not exactly sure what, what uh, and when that occurred, but obviously his grandfather was a huge part um, of his life and um, it meant a lot to him, yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of keen to dig in on the big man. He's a character that fascinates me. So... Hasn't lost since the 2019 World Championships. That's 27 competitions and counting. This year alone, as well as breaking the 31-year-old drug-tainted world record with 23.37 metres at the US Trials, he only failed to break 22 metres at one of his 12 meets outdoors and three times went past 23. So the guy's an absolute giant, 2.01 metres, 141 kgs, but... You've finished ahead of him 10 times at major meets from 2016 to 2019. So any ideas how he's got so much better in two years? Look, I think uh, Ryan's probably a person that is somewhat catered to a COVID lockdown. Um, he is just one of those characters who uh, he trains kind of by himself anyway. Um, he doesn't. His father kind of coaches him, but not really. He writes his own strength and conditioning programs. He's kind of like a one-man band. He doesn't have many people that are in his team. Um, so when the lockdown came around, it was kind of didn't really matter to him. You know, he's gonna he's a guy that will throw he'll throw twenty two fifty whether he's throwing it. Um, you know, Rafferty Domain with five school kids around him. Uh, on a blow, northwest, north, blowy north, northwestery bit day that's 15 degrees. But he also threw 2250 at the Olympic Games. Um, so he's just that type of competitor. Um, and it doesn't really matter to him who else is around, where I get a lot of energy when I know, I just know that I need to be in my game. Um, so that's kind of one of the things with Ryan. He, he had a big you know, stint of time there where no one bothered him. And and um, to be honest, you know, he competed a lot in 2020, uh, went to Europe and did six or seven comps, um, which I'll add that I wasn't at any of them. Um, so that's why his win streaks may be a little bit longer. But, uh, but yeah, he uh, – and, yeah, he, look, all, all ups to him because he's had uh, the most successful probably two years of any male shot putter ever. Um but the, but, the, but the thing that is still crazy is that what he's doing, no one's done before. And what Joe and I are doing, no one's done before as well. Yeah. <laughs> so it kind of shows you how strong men's shot it is. It just means Ryan at the moment is just, is just clicking. Um, but really there's not – yes, when you look at the results at the Olympics, yes – like he threw 20, 23, 30 on the last throw. Um, yes, there's almost a metre there, but 
we're talking about milliseconds of timing that changes things, you know, mill, millimeters of, of foot position or, or, or center of mass position that can change things. Um, um, and there's not really a hell of a lot of difference between, you know, throwing 2250 and throwing 2350. Uh, it's just belief. It's just letting it go. Um, and it's just about getting that rhythm and getting that going. And, and he's a guy that's just getting it lined up at the moment. Um, and uh, he's, he's making us all look bad. <laughs> well, you, you say he's making you look bad, but that crew, for want of a better term, take us inside that kind of shot put and click. So you get on a plane, you get back on the circuit. Is it like yeah. the boys are back in town, the three amigos here? <laughs> again like is it is it that kind of that bromance are you guys having beers after training are you pushing tin in the gym having comps to see you can bench or squat or deadlift like is it yeah. kind of that jocular look it, um not all the time um and it depends who with too uh as i said ryan's a little bit of his own man so he kind of does his own stuff a little bit um but we still do have beers afterwards and so forth we try to really actually encourage that um and try and create that for the younger guys coming up um, because I remember when I was the first yeah, the youngest guy on tour I got taken under my wing, wing by um, you know Ryan Whiting who's a really good mate of mine and he, here you go Tommy come here come with us uh, we'll go to this pizza joint after the competition we'll have a few beers we'll talk a bit of shit um, you know and, and and that's kind of that's for me especially that's part of it you know we're here to enjoy things uh, we're here to you know talk shit on each other um we're here to you know just have a good time as well as throwing a long way so with joe and i get on really well um so joe and i we uh when we're together traveling we try and travel together um so it's two of us rather than just you by yourself um we try and throw together when we can um so there's always some competition stuff um you know when we're when we're training together uh it might only be one throw out of a set but it was still training you know i think i uh i um i i think i had to buy four or five of the guys kebabs one day because i uh i didn't i, I think i missed the mark by about 10 centimeters so there's all things like that that go on so um it is good fun uh and i definitely don't take joe on uh in the weight room because uh he is a freak that's for sure can we can we talk numbers on that have you got any numbers you can throw out just for the uh <laughs> For him, yeah. Go so on. Joe, look at yourself. Look, whatever. Yeah. So, Joe, how about I go first? So then I kind of sound impressive, and then Joe yeah, yeah, go just on. not. Um, so bench. Uh, what have I done? Two forty bench. Uh, I've squatted three twenty for a full squat, which oh. is okay. I've, <laughs> I've deadlifted. Um, I did lift it with a trap bar, if you know what a trap bar is. Uh, yeah. I've done 430 for three. Um, How do you yeah. get 430 so, on a bar? That's a big bar. <laughs> and thin ones. Yeah. Um, oh. So, look, those are, those, are, those, are my, uh, those are my numbers, which, you know, you go, not many people can do that, uh, and you're quite right. But um, – you know, Joe can straight bar. So trap bar is easier than straight bar. I think I straight bar probably – straight bar deadlift, that is. I think I probably straight bar deadlift like 360, 370 maybe, um, oh. where Joe straight bar deadlifts 430. Um, he has done five squats at 398 kgs, which is – it was 880 pounds, which is just short of 400 kgs. Uh, he's power clean 220. Um, uh, he's jerked like 280. He's benched 310. Jeez. Yeah. It's good numbers. Oh, um, oh, go on, Steve. No, I just love the image. I, I love hearing that you guys hang out, and I, I love yeah. the image. I'm not sure if this is how it actually goes, but when you're on tour, you go into a public weight room. And it's just you and him, two absolute beasts, just smashing the tin, and everyone's like, "Who the fuck are these guys?" Yeah, that's, that's sometimes, that sometimes. Sometimes, quite often, we got to use you know, you know, CrossFit gyms or something like that. You know, so it's uh, they always kind of get you know, because 
Joe Joe's shorter than me, and he's 155 kg, so he's literally a square ball, and uh, square square block. Sorry, not square ball. Um, but uh, he like people. You, he's big, but he's not like tall and kind of. So you kind of just like, oh, who's that fat guy walking in? And then he kind of starts doing his thing, and you're like, Jesus, you know. So um, yeah, we definitely get some good looks. I think the best story about um, us, we. Um, there was about six or seven of us one night after the comp. We went to this um, we went to this pub and uh, bouncer let us in. So we kind of went and sat down, got some beers, and about ten minutes later, there's three bouncers came over to us and we're like, "Geez, what have we must have done something already?" You know. And um, the guy comes over and goes, "One of the middle guy, who's the biggest guy, is small really compared to any of us." Um, kind of uh, in broken English, was like, uh, "Guys." No trouble, no trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and pretty much what he was saying was like, because if you have trouble, like we're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it's really good. I could I could listen to these all all night. I, I just I, I want to. So our our shot put experience is often via television, right? So we we don't see what happens in between. You've kind of alluded to talking shit in between throws, and the best analogy I can kind of come up with is when you go 10 pin bowling and you might throw down a strike and you turn around to your mates that are playing with you and be like, Oh, I wouldn't really want to follow that. Is it the same <laughs> thing when you let one go that just flies out of your hand? Are you turning around to the other blokes and going, wouldn't want to be next boys. <laughs> you look at it, 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 it can be a bit like that. Some of the guys, um, just like anything, don't talk any shit, but uh, there's a bunch of guys now who are starting to give it a little bit. Um, we're going, you know, or, you, or some guys go, oh, fucking thanks for throwing that before me, you dick, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, there, there is definitely a little bit of, a little bit of banter that goes on uh, on the sidelines, but nothing too too crass or too bad. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Nice. I, want, I want to take us back uh, to the start, to growing up, sort of teenage Tom. Um, I'm really fascinated. Our group of friends at school, <laughs> loved a guy who was super strong or super fast or super tall, these kind of guys that, that were on the fringes and we used to make up sort of hypotheticals about like what they're like and, and different things. Anyway, there was a guy at school I remember, Tennis Fowry. I remember him, his name to this day. A huge guy. He wasn't allowed to play rugby because he was too big in intermediate school. Just the king of the shot put, though. That's a long-winded way of asking, what age did you realise that you were this super strong guy who could absolutely decimate your peers and did you have a bit of a, a reputation or nicknames at school about being so incredibly strong <laughs> um i had i was called sasquatch um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry sorry oh god so that, was, that, was, that was that was the one um through school that I got called, um, and actually, it ended up being that uh, a few um, a few years later, there was a bigger kid that came. So he was called Junior, and I was called Senior Sasquatch. So uh, yeah, but uh, look, uh, yeah, there was that was probably the only real nickname around the size that I had. Actually, you know, playing cricket here in Christchurch, um, I got called Mule because I used to they used to just point me into the wind and say, "There you go, Tommy Bubble into the wind." Um, they used to call me Roids as well because I was a big guy. So, um, you know, just all the those those are probably the three that come to mind. Yeah. Did you get the little cheeky guys at school though, saying, "Come on, Tom, give us an arm wrestle," or you know, challenge your fight or anything still, like that? I still get that to this day. You know, there's the guys that are you know, there's a number of middle aged guys who you should rock up to a pub, they have a beer with your mate. And then next thing you know, they're tapping you on the shoulder going, come on, Tommy, let's have an arm wrestle. Like, I've got nothing to prove here, man. Like, just leave me alone. <laughs> um, I've, I've, seen, I've seen on social media recently you're in the nets with a neighbour or something like that, mm. and there was a throwaway line about the Black Clash. But is that a genuine, mm. if you're in the country, is that something that you want to get involved in? Because I heard you're a bit of a cricketer back in the day. Yeah, we can, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd like to think I was. Um, I played prem cricket in Christchurch for three years um, when I left school up here. So um, I, was, I was all right. Uh, to be honest, it was more around the team around me. I was kind of just the, the 11th guy that filled the spot. But, um, yeah, look, I, I've actually been asked the last three years um, to play in it. 
um, and uh, have had to turn them down every year because dates haven't lined up. Um, so not sure if the invitation still stands. It's one of those things where if you keep turning it down, they don't keep coming back, I think. So we'll have to wait and see. I, I might have to give Flem a text and, and, uh, and maybe give him a wind-up. Now, this might be a bit of a stereotype, but what sort of a cricketer were you? Because I'm thinking <laughs> slogger. I'm thinking big hitter, you know, line it up, going for six with big Tom at the crease. Yeah, I, I tried. I tried. Uh, I, I bowled these dirty in swingers. Um, so I was a medium pace bowler, probably first change. Bowled a hard ball. Um, I'd like to think. Uh, and then I, you know, I like to swing the old willow a little bit too. So I was a, I was an all rounder. Yeah. yeah. It's good cricket chat. You've 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 name dropped Flem in there. Is he part mm. of a golf foursome that you sometimes swing about with on Christchurch courses? Yeah, well, it's not not just a force, and it's kind of there's about sixteen guys in this this uh, chat group that, that play some they play on Wednesdays, so sometimes I get to play with them. Um, so it's a good group of guys for sure, and uh, yeah, I love my golf. There's a couple there's a couple other names in there though, aren't there? You're being a bit coy, but I feel like there's an Israel Dag that knocks about and and bits and pieces. Yeah, there's, okay. So who else is in there? Izzy's in there when he hasn't broken his foot riding a motorbike. Um, who else? Oh, Nathan Astle's in there. Chris Harris, Craig McMillan. Um, yeah, so there's a it's a good group of guys for sure. And Bears sometimes. Jesus. Like them too. There's a few, uh, there's a few podcasts, potential podcast guests for us, so we might need to uh, hit you up afterwards and see if you can link us in. Yeah. <laughs> well, so you've said that you know, growing up, it was sort of all blacks and black caps as as kind of the direction you thought you would like to go. Was there a moment where that sort of became a fork in the road and you had to give those away for shot put? Was there a moment where it all crossed over? Yeah, so I, I gave up rugby um, my first year out of school. Um, I played Colts up here for for a winter and then kind of was just like, I, I, I ruined my shoulder um, the year before playing rugby and I was kind of like, I didn't do anything about it and I kind of wondered why it hurt all the time. And then I played the following year and I went and got, got it checked up and the surgeon's like, well, if you want to keep playing rugby, you're probably going to have surgery on it. He's like, it's probably fine for cricket and athletics. So I was like, ah, oh, stuff it. You know, I, I think I played my last year of school, I played something like 45 games of rugby. You know, it was yeah, something like ridiculous. Um, and so I was kind of just over it. Um, so I kind of stopped rugby then. Um, and then uh, to carry on playing rugby and cricket, uh, sorry, cricket and athletics, uh, and played cricket until I was 21. And uh, the fork on the road was when, I went to I went over to Europe in the winter to try qualify for World Champs, and usually to go to World Champs, uh, there's um, there's a qualifying distance, and this qualifying distance was 20 meters and 10 centimeters, uh, and I had five or six comps to do it in. My PB before that was 1980. I thought, yeah, for sure, like I'll just keep getting better, and I'll, I'll definitely qualify and get to go to my first ever World Champs. Uh, my second comp, and I think I threw 2007. I was like, oh, shit, that's really close. Yeah, I'll get it. I'll get it in the next few. Comes to the last comp, and, and I throw 2009 uh, in the comp. And, uh, they, you know, I, I try and do all the tricks of the trade. Um, so they, they're, they're measuring it with a normal old tape that stretches over time. I'm like, I want to steal tape on that kind of thing, which usually gives you a little bit of distance. Didn't give me any more. This toe board was a little wobbly. I kicked the toe board back further into the circle, <laughs> which is the thing they measure it off. Still didn't get enough, um, you know, all these kind of things. So um, anyway, so I had a 24-hour flight coming home, missing out on World Championships by one centimetre to kind of think about things. And I was kind of like, well, I'm training for cricket like four days a week. I'm training for athletics like four days a week. I'm working um, – I think I was working five days a week at that time, but as a builder, um, like, what's going on? Because what, what I used to do is I used to work all day. I got a cricket training from um, 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, I'd shoot via home. I'd pick up some food, and I'd go and do some throwing training, or I'd go and lift after that. So that kind of happened, you know, two or three nights a week. Um, and I was kind of like, well, I'm kind of putting my eggs in – each of these baskets and I'm not really getting any return from any of them, you know? So I was like, well, cricket, 
cricket, you know, stuff it. You know, I missed out on World Championships by one centimetre. I'm going to give this a year and see what happens. So cricket, you can bugger off. You know what? I work. I only want to work three days a week. So I talked to a guy I was working for, and he said, "Yep, no problem. We'll support that. You can do that." Um, so I started working three days a week and started training um, six days a week for for throw. Uh, and you know, six months later, I got third at World Indoors. Um, so you know, just like that, and I threw a meter. That was a meter twenty further than what I'd thrown the pre six months earlier, um, you know, so, and, and that kind of started the whole journey and that meet then opened the door to all these other meets um, uh, that year from rather than being away for uh, six weeks before Commonwealth Games, I was away, you know, for five months and started getting on the pro circuit and, and all these things. So that was kind of the, the moment of time where I, you know, put all my eggs in one basket and kind of went, and then that paid off for me, which was really good. Um, but saying that, I do actually encourage everyone, even like young school kids, to play as many sports for as long as they can. Um, you know, I played uh, played four sports through high school, hockey as well. Uh, I think it's just great to have different sports that you can play. And, and if a coach says, no, no, you can only do this one, then, well, I'd be asking some pretty strong questions around that because – I don't think anyone at, at a school level should be training four or five days a week for one sport. You know, can we can we loop back to that one centimeter miss? Because I've read an anecdote, and I want to know if it's factual or not. Where, when you got back on the building site, your colleagues were ribbing you about, oh, "Tommy, this is actually uh, one centimeter short here. We need to redo it." Is that a genuine? Are you genuinely getting hammered like that by yeah. your colleagues? Well, on the on the building site, they, they call it 10 mil. Um, so they, they'd always just go, hey, Tommy, yeah, cut this 960, all right? Yeah, we won't cut it. Oh, hey, mate, it's 10 mil short. Do you want to do that again? <laughs> is, that, is, is, that a is it a daily thing? Uh, it, was, it was for quite a while, yeah. It was for quite a while. And there was a, there was a thing going around on site. My, my foreman said, look, um, the day you win an Olympic medal, you can order me around for a day, but until then... I get to order you around. <laughs> um, you made a comment back there. You said, you know, it, it finally paid off. Now, Shay Seamus gives me shit about this all the time because he says, I'm, all I do is ask about money. All I ask is how much the athletes earn. Maybe it's because I'm a journalist, so I'm just fascinated by how much other people earn. But uh, when you win these events, or at what point did you realise a career in shot put was financially sustainable? You know, you're thinking about buying a house and starting a family and things like that. Do you have to get a few wins for, for you to be set up for the next year? Or how does that whole part of it work? Yeah, well, look, it's not golf, I'll tell you that much. Um, uh, <laughs> it's uh, Look, the Diamond League circuit is, is where the, the prize money is. And what you've got to remember is, Unless you've got an apparel sponsor, which I did have, I had Nike for quite a while, which I was getting a salary from and bonuses from. Um, unless you've got a, a, a one of those, it's purely done on performance. Um, you're getting paid on performance. And even with a Nike contract, it's pretty much on performance. If you don't perform, you get your contract gets cut pretty much. Um, so that's one thing. We don't have much you know, financial security around the – prize money and appearance fees because it's all done on how you're going. Because um, if you're old news, they're not going to pay an appearance fee for you. And if you get third or fourth, the money drops off bloody fast. Um, so, you know, for example, in the Diamond League, it goes uh, 10 for first, 6 for second, uh, 4 for third, 3 for uh, uh, three for fourth, a uh, fifth, you know, down, down really quickly. So, you know, like before you know it, and there's only seven of those a year. Um, so, you know, if you get, you know, fourth um, through to eighth in, in those, you can only make probably 15 or 20K um, a year from that. Um, so it is, it, uh, you've got to be good and you've got to keep throwing far because otherwise there's not much money, cash around um, for, for shop putters especially. And, and yes, for sure it's different depending on what uh, event group you're in. Um, sprinters, well, they get looked after. Uh, and uh, middle distance runners, they get looked after too. But, uh, you know, few events are kind of the, the bottom of the heap. I feel like an asshole for, for about to ask this question. But 
given what you've just explained, in terms of the hierarchy of events, what what's more important then, the the Diamond League, or the the pinnacle events, the World Championships and the Olympic Games, for you as a, as a professional athlete? Well, they are somewhat intertwined because depending on how you go at Olympics, um, lets you get into other comps easier as well. Um, so if you medal at Olympics or World Championships, then therefore you can probably ask for an appearance fee and get an appearance fee. If you don't, then you're not going to get one. Um, so, right. look, the, the, the major championships, which are World Championships, Commonwealth Games, um, World Indoors, World um, Olympic Games are the big ones um, for me. Uh, I still stand by that um, because it does trickle down for sure. Tom, what's, talk to us a little bit about your relationship with um, Dale Stevenson because I've heard some some great sort of whispers that you guys have a bunch of um, techniques, I'd call them, used in training to to motivate each other, which perhaps might be a bit unusual <laughs> for other high-performance athletes. Oh, look, yeah. Look, um, Dale and I were actually um, mates before we started um, – before I started getting coached by him. He uh, – he was a thrower. He went to the 2012 Olympics for Australia um, for shot put. So I actually trained with him quite a bit, um, you know, around that time, uh, which was quite cool. Uh, and then he started working with me in, I think it was 15 or maybe 14, late 14. Uh, and, yes, we do have some uh, some different ways of motivating people uh, or motivating ourselves. Um, one of them, I've got, I've got a tattoo on my foot because I lost a bit. Uh, he's a bald man, so he had to grow his hair out uh, one time for six months, which was horrendous. Um, I had to blade shave my head because I didn't go that well at a comp one day. Um, yeah, so there's all these type of wee, uh, wee bits. Look, I, I, I can't remember all of them. Um, but uh, yeah, so what, what are you doing in these in these instances? Is he saying you've got to throw this far, and you're saying, "Yep, I can beat it." And if you don't, you've got to do this forfeit. Yeah, look, there's the, those the big bits um, are, are always uh, um, are for, on like a major championships or something like that. Uh, and usually, there's a, a decent negotiation that goes on. It generally, goes on for probably three or four days um, to to t- try and like. You get the best side of the deal, but but also my my um my coach Dale is uh, he's a very good gambler uh, and makes too much money from gambling. Uh, we used to used to before he was a uh, a coach, but um, so he's very good at you know having his his way with things. Um, so you just got to be careful because he's never going to take a bet that he thinks he's going to lose. Um, so I think I've lost more than what I've won, but. You know, that's the athlete. There's always the, the hopeful the hopeful side of them. Yeah, it's always a sign of a good gambler. Um, I wanna, I've, I've heard you talk about this in another interview, but I want you to sort of expand on it. Um, you come out of as the world champ to the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games, and, and I've heard you sort of suggest that perhaps you were tinged with disappointment after winning gold, which seems really crazy from my world. It's like if you win a championship or a final, it doesn't really matter how you play. It's just you've got the gold. But but that perhaps wasn't the case for you in that event? No, no, it wasn't. Um, Commonwealth Games for me is probably like the, the third tier of um, of majors. Um, so you've got Olympic Games, obviously, once every four or five years, depending on what goes on. Uh, World Champs. Uh, world Outdoor Champs, World Indoor Champs, then Commonwealth Games. And that's purely just because the Commonwealth is getting better at shot put, um, but isn't that good. You take away all the Americans, you take away a lot of Europe, that's a lot of the, the top 10 guys in the world. Um, so I was really going there to, to throw it to throw it a long way. Um, and I did in the qualifying rounds, like I threw 22-45. And then I started to... Um, I started to think like, shit, you know, like I'm on here. Like I could, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I think I'm in world record shape because I, I, I was, I was in world record shape. Uh, and then, then I started hearing people talk, you know, like people at the track. Hey, hey, Tommy, nice qualifying, mate. Um, you reckon today could be the day? I'm like, today's going to be the day. 
yeah, today's going to be the day, yeah. And then they kind of go on and someone else say, what do you reckon, you got, you got 23 in you? Yeah, I do, yeah, yeah. So uh, before I knew it, you know, I was spinning out of control about worrying about 23 metres rather than worrying about the shit that actually matters, um, the shit that actually helped me throw uh, 23 metres. Uh, and then I go in there and throw 21.40 and somehow win um, and just throw horribly and, you know, just, yeah. I don't know how the hell I actually threw 2140. I was throwing that badly, but uh, I got the I got the old uh, card in front of the horse there a little bit. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, looking back, it's uh, similar to the your, outside, it, it shows why you are a world champion to win a Commonwealth Games gold and not be satisfied with it. Displays a certain sort of I don't know work ethic or high level, which is mm. is very unusual. I'd suggest. Yeah, and and look, yes, I am extremely grateful that I won because the previous ones I had a chance to win and I didn't. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was definitely there for something. Not I wasn't there just for the medal. I was there to throw a long way, uh, and I was in the shape to throw a long way, but I, I let the voices outside, and, <laughs> outside get the better of me rather than listen to the inside voices and, and kind of strain, staying true, true to you know, what I know works. Um, and uh, that definitely, you know, I've been very fortunate. Generally, I've had these wee hiccups at competitions that hasn't affected me at dramatically. I've managed to win or I, or it was a, a random comp uh, in, in the middle of nowhere and, and I kind of learned a lot from it. And then it hasn't happened uh, for me at a major championship, um, you know. So uh, I was just lucky enough to be good enough on the day to have a bad day and, and still get it done. That, so um, that notion. Now you're. I think I've I've got a little bit of a delay, so I'll I'll go <laughs> I'll go now. That that notion of of kind of, I guess it's like, it's all resting on that day, right? And and I I think about your uh, Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, where in qualifying you throw I think it was a games record, mm -hmm. and you're flying, and then the next day someone goes out and just betters it again. <laughs> I, I, you don't the thought of not having an opportunity, I guess, the following week like you do in team sports or in a league competition, that's just a, that's a head fuck for me as well, thinking I've done so well and then like that, someone's just mm. biffed it a little bit further than I have. Yeah, and um, that was ordained. So for the, for the longest time, the saying was, oh, you got ordained. You know, he came out of, he came out of nowhere and, uh, you know, which he always did. And, and um, so, so I got ordained a few times. Um, but uh, it is it is different, right? But that's what makes when you win and when it, when you pull it off even more worthwhile. Um, and uh, and that what that's what's so good about that rush. You know, it's, it's such a, a big rush when things go to plan and everything lines up and you and you throw really well in a major championship because you know you know you've trained. It's, you know the last. I, you know, 12 months has been building towards that and, you know, the work you've done for the last 24 months or the last three or four years is all added to that. So it's, um, it is pretty tough for sure and, and there's nowhere to hide. You can't hide behind your mate, that's for sure, because you're the only one out there. The, the other note uh, that has piqued my interest is the 2017 World Champs. You won with a seven centimetre tear in your groin. Now, I'm a man who has had a lot of injuries over my uh, amateur football career, and I've done my groin a number of times. I how do you move with a – how do you throw with a torn groin? Like, that's surely got a – that's that's incredible. How'd that happen? Yeah, so um, I tore it uh, – I, I tore it the day before qualifying. It was kind of – I had a few more throws to go in the training session – uh, and I felt it go. I'd done it before a few times, and I still I've done it a few more times since. It's kind of something that happens in a rotational sport when you're swinging your leg out wide. Um, and uh, I knew I knew I'd done. It. I literally packed up my gear. Yeah, and usually, like I'm a guy at the training sessions that you know, say talks to everyone, says hi, bye, kind of see you tomorrow, mate. Yeah, but shit, you're not looking that good, eh? Hey? You know, that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, I was out of there. So everyone kind of knew something had happened, um, and uh, they didn't. I no one. I didn't tell anyone anything had happened. But 
uh, everyone kind of knew. So I got a few texts and stuff. I said, oh, no, mate, I'm fine. Nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about. But um, kind of the way I looked at it was, look, what have I got to lose? If I come into qualifying um, and I, 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 I can't throw, I just get on the plane and go home, right? That's it. I've tried. I've tried. But at least I'm giving it a crack. So the first round of qualifying, uh, I threw 22-14, which was the season's best. Didn't hurt at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but saying that, the warm-up throws went about 1850 and hurt like hell, <laughs> you know? So I was just like, I didn't actually know if I was going to actually even throw in one. So, um, so that's that fine. Adrenaline? Is that just adrenaline you put that it down was, to? It, it must have been in qualifying because the two warm-up throws I had – in the stadium just before, like I almost crawled out of the circle. Um, I was like, well, what's the worst that can happen? So that was kind of the thing I was looking at. Like, oh, I'll just roll the dice and see what happens. So got through, top qualifier, sweet, season's best. Jeez, don't need an adductor to throw a shot put, do I? Um, and then uh, there, was a, there was two days between the, the qualifying and the final, which was actually quite beneficial. So got a lot of treatment. Um, but one thing I'm – really focused on doing was trying to think positively about the whole situation uh, and not trying to waste too much energy on it and like why did it happen to me what could I have done differently any of that stuff um, so I was in quite a um, I was just in my own zone uh, and I didn't the only people person that knew was Dale knew um, my physio knew and that was it um, well the physio that was there knew so there's only three people uh, that knew um, I was getting texts from my manager who was there going, why were you crawling out of the circle, you know? Like, oh, no, mate, fine, don't worry about it, you know. <laughs> so um, some people kind of knew something was up. But then um, then coming to the final, I was just like, look, I'm not meant to win this. I'm kind of the third guy at this point in time. Ryan and Joe were the top two guys. Um, you know, let's just roll the dice. If I get one throw... Yeah, you know, that's great. If I get two throws, that's great. I'll just keep going. So, you know, I, I led that comp from start to finish um, and and through my first throw in the last round. Uh, but what was so great about it was that um, my parents were there, uh, my girlfriend was there, my first ever coach was there, um, and it was just a, an, amazing, um, an amazing time. Uh, and, you know, and, and literally – Within probably two or three hours after the competition, I was um, hobbling around and uh, like I, my my adductor was cooked. So it was purely adrenaline. Um, and uh, and yeah, I actually remember a story from that night. Was I remember rocking up to we we found this pub not far from the stadium. And you, the problem is usually what happens is you, you do your competition, and sometimes they give you the medal there, um, but sometimes they don't give it. They give it the next day but even if they don't give it to you then you've got to do your drug testing uh you got to you got to do uh media interviews as you exit the stadium you got to do media interviews in like a conference hall um and you got to do all these other things so usually the confidence let's just say the comp finished at 9 30 i wasn't probably out of there until midnight um so anyway we my parents had had a few oh geez that was something um and my parents had had a few by this time and and it must have been a um, good time for the news to kind of get them. Uh, and uh, they're doing a live cross um, to New Zealand. And my father is terrible with his phone. Like he is on his phone all the time, just calls all the time. He's a pretty busy guy. But halfway through this interview, he's got a, one of those top pocket ones with his phone in the top <laughs> pocket. Halfway through a live cross back to New Zealand from London, he gets a phone call. He pulls it out. Oh, hey, Snowy, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> and the reporter oh, supposedly good. just didn't know what the hell was going on. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that was one funny story from that night. And then he was that going around going um, a few hours later, he was going, as we're leaving, he was going to everyone who was there, he was going to my mother, he was going, how does it feel to be the world championship's mother? Uh, it's world champion. And then he's going to my girlfriend. How does it feel to be the world champion's girlfriend? 
and all these songs like he's just having a hell of a good time <laughs> yeah that that was my that was my next question you win a world championship as a shot putter you're not exhausted. Yeah, I can't imagine you're exhausted. Perhaps the same way some of the other athletes might be. Yeah, and you've got this torn groin. Are you doing the right protocols? Are you icing it? Are you, are you just on the piss and years <laughs> in the? No, no in we um, it actually worked out quite well. I think the next day was a dead day in athletics, so there wasn't actually any events on. And so we, um, I think we're staying at the staying somewhere in, in London that had a, a rooftop bar, and so we. You know, we all went up there as a team and, and some of my fa- friends and family came around and, and um, had a few fantasies, that was for sure. So that, that period, 2017, I think you were Halberg Sportsman of the Year, 2018 Halberg Sportsman of the Year and Supreme Award winner. I think I've got that right. Um, that... The Halbergs are, are, are huge in the sort of sports media world. Everyone is aware of them and loves talking about who's going to get them. <laughs> I'm not sure if you realised that at the time and, and how big that possibly is and allows others to celebrate your success with you. But was that a really special moment, sort of being presented on stage as the best in front of, like you say, your heroes and the All Blacks and the Black Caps and the Silver Ferns <laughs> or whoever else? So that must have been pretty special. <laughs> Before I forget, I'll tell you a funny story um, about this. Is um, so the next morning I'm flying obviously down to Christchurch, and uh, I've got the fucking trophy case, which is big. It's sitting at probably you know one point two, one point three meters, and it's heavy. Uh, it's really heavy. And um, I go to check in, and I've got a bag with me, so I check the bag in, and uh, I think Dana was using my other bag, so you know. And I kind of go to like, do you reckon I can you know, maybe get this through? You know, do you, I don't. She goes, what is it? I go, oh, it's a trophy. She goes, should have, you should have bought another bag then, shouldn't you? She goes, I didn't know I was going to win it. So I ended up having to pay to transfer the Halberg trophy from Auckland to Christchurch on Air New Zealand. So thanks, guys. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so that was that was quite funny. Um, but uh, going back, yeah, I, I don't think I realised uh, how much it meant to to me, but n- not necessarily me, but the wider sports community generally. Until the next day, I don't think the next day I'd been stopped as much as what I. I don't think I've been stopped as much since. Um, everyone was kind of just whether it was like, oh, well done, congratulations, or, or something. That was it was just you know continuous. So. Um, it is uh, it is pretty cool um, to say that I was named that. Um, and uh, it's safe to say, actually, here's a funny fun fact for you. I've, um, I've won the South Canterbury Sports Awards the same amount of times as I've won the Supreme Halberg Award. <laughs> wow. It's a, a good stat. Yeah. Um, have, have there been any other times when you've – you mentioned before you and Emma Twig were doing some public speaking – have you been used as a motivational speaker or to speak to another group of elite athletes uh, because of your success? Do you know, do you know, geez, where, where are you getting your stories from? Uh, we don't reveal our sources. Uh, we don't ever reveal our sources. <laughs> oh, well, I'm not sure if you've heard this one, but I, um, I, uh, I got asked to speak to the Black Caps. Um, you have heard this one, or is this the one you go on? Uh, no, I'm just interested. On. Really interested. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I got asked to talk to the Black Caps um, before it was a test match down in Christchurch. I can't remember who they were playing. Um, but so when I played cricket, I played a lot of cricket with um, a few of the guys. So Tom Latham, Matt Henry, Henry Nichols, um, and stuff like that. So, so there was guys in the room that I'd played with a lot and I played against a lot. And so I'm a cricket guy. I love cricket. And so they mean, like, I had a lot of respect for them. And, and so I got to do this talk, and it's a, quite an open kind of thing. I'm like, hey, Tommy, do you want to just come in and, and present the caps and um, just give a wee, you know, two or three-minute chat to the boys and just about what it means to be a New Zealander. Just take it whatever way you want. And I'm just going, I've got to ask the print, you know, the black caps, to the, <laughs> the black caps, you know. This is, like, awesome. Yeah, and you kind of haven't really given me a steer with where to go with this talk. 
So, you know, I was kind of nervous. I didn't really know where to go. But uh, I figured out. I can't even remember what I said, but I had a few notes down. But when I was standing up there, I'm, I'm generally pretty – Public speaking doesn't bother me really. I'm actually not too bad at it. Um, I don't get too nervous. But I had a wobbly knee that night. Did I ever? <laughs> so I was standing up the front in front of the guys, just in this kind of conference room, and my knee started like wobbling, like <laughs> bending and straightening and bending and straightening, you know, like that. And I'm like, what's going on? I'm trying to talk at the same time. So I put my weight on it, and it stops. And then the other side starts going. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just do this the whole time. And the guys must just thought, what the fuck is going on here? But that's just kind of, that's just how much it meant to me, um, you know, speaking to the guys. And, do you um, remember now what you said? A two or three minute chat. Like, well, <laughs> what's your message? <laughs> oh, I think it was something like, um, uh, oh, you know, uh, it's always an amazing time for me to wear the sort of fern. Um, I always feel like there's a, there's a country behind me, that kind of stuff. Um, wear it with pride, know that it's a special moment, that kind of shit. Right. But I remember one thing I said at the end. I said, um, you know, thanks for letting me have a chat. Um, by the way, Tommy, you're always a prick to bow to. Bow to. Toey, who's, who's met, um, a Henry Nichols, um, you're always a bit lippy under the lid. And Matt Henry, I, you know, you always bowled it a bit, bit too quick for me. I didn't like your bounces, you know, so I think I picked the right sport. So uh, I kind of finished it on something like that. But, uh, yeah, it was – it was. It, you kind of don't know what to say because they, they've all heard it before. And, yeah, so I kind of just see what it meant to me and, and uh, went from there, yeah. It's, it's, it's so funny that the people who's uh, who fluster you, you know, I've, I've heard you yeah. say that you don't really care what people think apart from the black caps. Like that, that's like <laughs> the, one, the one group of people who you, you care yeah. what they think of you. Yeah, yeah it, is, it is a little bit funny. Um, and you don't realise until you're probably in the moment that with it. So, yeah. I think it's awesome. I mean, me and Steve are in a privileged position. These conversations with amazing kiwis over 62 episodes and it's still i buzz out when i hear someone like yourself talking about them buzzing out over the black caps which is what i tend to do on some of our episodes as well i'm just i sit here and we have these conversations with people and it's awesome it's great to know that i guess our athletes are just everyday people as well who do superhuman things in their kind of respective fields yeah for sure and uh yeah it's um i'm really lucky i've got to meet some Pretty amazing people in all sorts, um, you know, walks of life, uh, whether it's businessmen or sportsmen, and uh, you know, it's opened a lot of doors, which is which is pretty cool. I've gone to some sporting events that uh, and uh, other bits and pieces that I've never knew, normally go to. So yeah, it's pretty pretty cool. We won't keep you much longer, Tom. There's just a few little bits and pieces. Uh, Shay, did you have a little tip about a, a triathlon transition or something? Oh, I just wondered about um, your, I mean, obviously you've got great people around you who support mm, yeah. you through your endeavours. <laughs> Sorry, mate, I, just, I, I can't hear you, mate. I, I, I'd, heard, I'd heard that uh, recently when you came out of MIQ, you had the opportunity to reciprocate potentially with your partner, Dana, and mm. it might not have, have gone completely to plan. No, look, I, I work well under stressful situations, um, so... I therefore chose to put myself in a very stressful situation, um, which you can only lose from. Um, so, look, at the start of the day, I had, a, I had a mate with me, Nick Smith, and his partner was uh, in the same team as Dana, and uh, we kind of said at the start of the day, look, look, there's not really much we can win here. We can only lose. If you, if you do it how it's meant to be done, well, you're meant to do it that way, you know, kind of thing. And if you don't do it that way, well, you're a bloody idiot. So the first, we only had one change at this point, actually. And um, so we dropped them off to, and to start their raft down the river. And uh, and we're like, all right, the, the kind of plan says that it, it might take them an hour and 15 to do it. That will be the fastest they do this rafting. So we said, all right, we'll get to the transition with, you know, half an hour to go until they're meant to be there. 
uh, if they were really fast. And uh, we'll have tons of time. We'll have tons of time to take the bikes off the roof, put the numbers on the bikes, put the nav thing on the front of the bikes that sticks up, make sure the food's out, your clothes out that they're going to get changed into, make sure the shoes are out nicely laid, all set up. Well, half an hour, tons of time. Cool. We'll rock up there, bang on 45 minutes, park up, get one bike off the roof, just kind of cruising, you know, <laughs> Second bike off the roof. Oh, yeah, that's no, not bad. We'll put that there, put that there. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, all good. I'm up there getting the third bike off the roof. I go, and someone I hear, oh, hi, Tom. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Oh, shit, shit, shit. Get the bike off the roof and I start fumbling with stuff. I just, you know, it was like a, it was like, I tell you what, it was like a Formula One team in the pits. Just smooth. <laughs> Uh, no, but uh, they were quite relaxed, which was quite lucky, um, and actually gave them a little bit more time to get out of get out of their wet wetsuits and uh, and things like that. So uh, you wouldn't yeah. have you wouldn't have been hearing about that every day for for the rest of your life either, would you? No, haven't heard about it once. <laughs> <laughs> Gold. Uh, anything else, Shay? Uh, for you to touch on? Yeah, I, I think there's some merit or an opportunity for this uh, amazing race kind of shot put competition that you put together in preparation for, for Tokyo. Was it 20 <laughs> Was it twenty circles that you had to hit 21 metres? No, other way around. So 21 circles with uh, and 20 metres. So, yeah, that was something a bit, a bit crazy that we, um, we kind of just thought, you know, 2021, you know, there wasn't much going on for the last, for 2020 especially. Um, so we just kind of thought, you know, what can we do? And, and it kind of gave us something to, to work towards. And, and it was a real challenge physically and mentally. Like, you know, you got you got four throws at each circle. Uh, if you didn't do it, then there was an X by your name. So, um, yeah, there was, uh, it took a while, it took us a while to find 20, 21 circles in Christchurch, but we found them. Um, and there were some real bad ones and there were some real good ones, but uh, it, was a, it was a long ass day, that was for sure. Nice. Too good. Um, well, Shay, anything else? Um, 2022, I guess. We need to look ahead as to uh, as to what you've got on the horizon. Um, pretty busy year for me. Uh, and also, you know, it, it, it's made, been, just been made a little bit easier with... The quarantine situation, hopefully, um, definitely will. They say it's seven days now for people returning, they're double vaxxed. Um, but hopefully home isolation um, by the time kind of March comes around, which will be when I'm away next. Um, so March, uh, end of March is World Indoors for me uh, in Serbia. So that will be nice. Uh, trying to defend my title there and, and win it again. Um, and then... World Champs in Oregon at the start of July, uh, start of July, and then Commonwealth Games uh, in Birmingham at the end of July. Uh, so I'll pretty much be away from, you know, May again through to September, with a west and away in um, to Serbia in March. So uh, yeah, it's going to be going to be a busy one. I guess the positive thing about the, the whole COVID thing is with athletics is they've jammed. Um, four years worth of events into three years, so it's uh, it's going to come thick and fast for me. Nice. And you've you've mentioned your love of golf, and I mm -hmm. gather that there's uh, potentially a trip to St Andrews after the uh, the Commonwealth Games. And I'm just wondering yeah. if if you and Dale have got anything riding on uh, on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look. It, it, uh, there is already a bet that he put down, and I haven't agreed to this. He said, uh, I'll, I'll pay you for the round and drinks if you're uh, engaged to Dana by then. If not, it's on you. So, uh, yeah. But, um, no, there's uh, – hopefully I might get up – sneak up there after Commonwealth Games. Uh, I also possibly might get on Augusta this year too. Um, so that's that's a big uh, – it could be a big, big year for me. Man, what a stitch up! What a stitch up question that one was. Um, <laughs> shout out, shout out to our little Tweety Bird. Uh, some gold in there. That Tom, that's been amazing. That's been such an enjoyable ninety minutes. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for giving us your time. Uh, good luck in the next year. It's going to be action packed. Uh, we'll be following it very closely. Shay, any final words? No, I just look forward to getting my uh, wall shot t shirt in the uh, in the deliveries whenever they come through. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I'll have to post one up. Probably, what, six, seven weeks out? 
Yeah, if you go up that big, yeah, even an even an eight or nine will probably help. <laughs> oh, Cheers, Tom. Thank you, guys. No worries. Stay on the line, mate. I'll um, I'll, I'll. Uh, what are we doing? We're going live Monday, Steve. Yeah, we'll, we'll, this will be live uh, Monday morning. So, um, man, that was awesome. Thanks so much. Oh, that for was amazing. Great, great yarns there. Eh? People are gonna love that. Nice. Yeah, Mate, look, part of the reason why I do it right is to enjoy the stuff outside the circle as much as I'm doing it in, inside the circle. So, um, mm -hmm. That's so, it was so nice. good. I, I mean, we outed we outed our little mole by the end of the uh, the end of the episode. Yeah. It was fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely he, fantastic. He leaks, he leaks like a sieve, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> it's good yeah. stuff. Um, we will we normally tag people on socials and do all that all that good stuff so if you're able to share it that's that's great um if yeah. you get any feedback as well we love hearing kind of feedback from other people about what okay. they thought we don't always we don't always get it but um yeah that's that's cool as well cool bloody good guys too easy Thanks, really man. that was that was awesome hopefully we get to see you and meet you in person at some stage and uh shake your hand and say good day who knows mate <laughs> yeah, exactly all right cool Thanks, Thanks guys. guys.